heard this plenty of times before the last few years, but this year, the statement seems especially true. These so-called blue wall states may flip in the upcoming elections. Now, the swing states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, they went to Democrats in the last couple of elections. But it now appears that voters could change their positions. And if that happens, <laughs> it could flip red as polling in all swing states overall appears neck and neck. NBC News said this. They say the blue wall states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania have paved the path to the White House for the last two Democratic presidents. But with just 14 days left until November 5th, there are concerns within the Kamala Harris campaign about whether the vice president, Kamala Harris, can claim all three states. Now, it notes, recent discussions have centered on the possibility of an anomaly happening this year, but just part of the blue wall breaking its way. And it's, it says the conversations have focused on whether Michigan or Wisconsin fall, quote unquote, to former President Donald Trump, while the two other states go blue, according to three sources with knowledge of Kamala's campaign strategy. And so again, anonymous sources are not saying who it comes from. NBC tends to be on their side of the political aisle. They typically won't write hit pieces on their side for the most part. And so typically if they do something like this, one has a bit more. Uh, it says a bit more, right? Now they note that losing Wisconsin or Michigan would mean that even if Harris secures Pennsylvania, where both Harris and Trump have spent the most time and resources, she would not reach the necessary 270 electoral votes in Electoral College to win the White House without winning another battleground state or possibly two. Meaning this is a real uphill battle. And, you know, basically they could win Pennsylvania and just lose a couple of these other states and still lose the election. Now, look, the issue in Michigan, let me just talk about a couple of these, uh, you know, blue wall states. Michigan, you know, a lot of people maybe don't know this, but there's a lot of Arab Americans there. There's a lot of Muslims there. And it's showing signs that they could vote against Democrats. For a lot of them, the real divisive issue has been the war in Gaza. The Guardian said this October 14th. It said that the Trump campaign would open an office in Hamtra, a Hamtramck, a tiny city of around 28,000 people north of downtown Detroit less than a month before the election speaks to a particular curiosity of the 2024 presidential race. It says about 40% of the residents in that area are of Middle Eastern or North African descent. 60% are believed to be Muslim Americans. And the city has an all-Muslim city council. Now, in other words, there, you know, people vote they have voted in all Muslims, right? The people they vote for. I Meaning that's a big issue for them, probably. Now, notes that in past elections, Arab Americans were a solidly Democratic voting bloc. They used to vote Democrat, especially in the years following 9-11, and given Trump's, they say, overtly anti-Muslim rhetoric. Debatable, but that's what they say. And notes, but with Kamala Harris reportedly, quote, underwater in Michigan, now three points behind Trump among likely voters having led the former president by five points as recently as last month, according to one recent poll, Muslim and Arab American communities across Michigan could play a major role in the outcome of the presidential election. And it says this, angry with the Biden administration and by extension Kamala Harris, because she's the vice president, for its support for Israel, Arab Americans may be willing to overlook Trump's history with close of closeness with Israel's hard right leaders. Now, there's a bit more to that. You know, a lot of them don't believe the way the war is being handled in Gaza and elsewhere is uh, responsible. A lot of them have problems with it, right? There's different debates on this, I know. Uh, but I'm just saying that, again, perception many of those voters have. And the issue is they believe a lot of the weapons are coming from the Biden administration. The Biden administration tried to kind of play both sides to it. On one side, the U.S. supports Israel full on. On the other side, the Biden administration has actually withheld weapons in some cases uh, because they're saying that Israel has not provided proper plans to avoid civilian deaths. They've tried kind of playing both sides, but the result of that is that both sides are kind of mad at them. They've had a lot of problems with a lot of Israeli Americans. They've had a lot of problems with the Arab Americans. And that's pushing a lot of people over to Trump. Not to mention, again, the perception that a lot of Democrats, not 
not all of them, but especially like the more far left, they've been behind a lot of the protests on the streets, pro-Gaza stuff. And so the Biden administration has been troubled with that because it's creating divisions within their party. Now, notes this. Previous elections show that voting in these countries, and so these counties, historically runs very close. And that's that in 2020, Trump won 53% of the Mocum County vote, a community that is home to an estimated 65,000 to 80,000 Arab Americans. Very close victory, right? And that's that even within Mocum County, voters are divided. Trump won Sterling Heights, a city home to a large Iraqi community. And notes that he won the one that by 11 percent, while Biden won Warren, a neighbor, neighboring city, by 14 percent. Now, what's important here, right? Previously, the elections in these areas were close; they were very close. And so, what does that mean if some voters are now changing the way they vote because of their perceptions? It means that even a very minor shift in votes in the swing counties of the swing states which determine basically which direction that whole state goes and could actually determine the way the whole country goes. It means that these states could flip to Donald Trump in 2024. And look, on the other side of it, some people are not going to go vote for either Harris or Trump. Uh, we're actually seeing in some of these areas that there's a third party candidate. A lot of them are voting Green Party, and they're just saying, I'm not going to vote for either. And so they're either not voting or voting third party. <laughs> Uh, so there's also that as well. But remember, for a lot of those voters, you know, if they're voting Green Party, which is what they're doing, that does tend to be on the left side of the political spectrum, meaning that those are probably former Democrat voters, people who might have voted Democrat, choosing to not vote for Trump or Harris. Now, look, it's also for this reason that the Harris campaign is now launching ads trying to win back Muslim Americans and Arab voters. This is becoming one of the key battlegrounds. The New York Times said it says, within two weeks left to go before the election, Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign is making a final push to win back Arab and Muslim voters. It says the campaign has launched Facebook ads targeting Muslims, created WhatsApp channels, and distributed fact sheets with Ms. Harris's uh, most forceful statements on the war in Gaza. And in private meetings and living rooms and basements across the country, including in the battleground states of Michigan, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, campaign workers are trying to reach voters who say they may stay home, vote third party, as we mentioned, or even vote for former President Donald J. Trump because of the Biden administration's policies in the Middle East. Now, look, uh, North Carolina is also becoming a big focus with this. It's not just Michigan, right? Uh, there's a few different states, but North Carolina is also one being impacted by kind of unforeseen circumstances. North Carolina is also a swing state, and especially with the recent disaster from Hurricane Helene, that could have a large impact on the way people vote. You know, back to that NBC article about the blue wall potentially cracking, it said this. It says that while North Carolina is still in the campaign sites and Democrats maintain strong organization leadership there, the Harris team is far less bullish about victory. It says four people with knowledge of the dynamic said this. He said, quote, of all the seven states, right, these are the swing states, that one seems to be a little bit slipping away, the Harris campaign officials said in North Carolina. Part of this is because Democrats won some of the you know local elections there, and because they won the local elections, think they have it in the bag. What does that mean? It means they don't campaign as hard. There's less money campaigning and they've kind of backed off. So what happens then? A disaster strikes, and if disaster strikes and people look at the response to it, what do they look at? They look at the incumbent government. And who is the incumbent government? Well, that's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Now, like Trump actually did win the state back in 2020, but it was close. And with that as well, you know, back to the overall picture of these blue wall states, if even a couple of these flip, not even all of them, just a couple. If they just changed the way it happened last time, this could very likely put Trump across the finish line at the Electoral College. Hot Air said this. He said in 2020, Joe Biden won all three blue wall states along with Georgia and Arizona, five of them, right? Flipping them against Trump to win the Electoral College, 306 to 200, uh, 232, 
And it says, thanks to shifts from the 2020 census uh, reappointment that narrows up this year to 303 to 235, a flip of almost any state, along with Pennsylvania, would come close to handing the election to Trump. It says, at the moment, however, Trump leads in every battleground state in RCP's uh, aggregation. And it's that Georgia, with its 16 electors, is almost certainly lost. <laughs> yeah, a lot Trump. of hot air with and the Democrats. Harris has only led in two polls there since Labor Day, and Trump's aggregate lead is plus 2.5. That alone is nearly half of the electors Trump needs to hit 270 for the election and win. And as a Trump leads in Michigan by 1.2 points, and worse yet, according to them, they say the trend line shifted away from Harris over the last month. And as a Quinnipiac, uh, Quinnipiac not exactly a GOP-leaning pollster, went from Harris plus five in mid-September to Trump plus four two weeks ago. In other words, it's changing very fast, and it's flipping to Trump. Now, look, of course, polling only says so much. Um, those of you who watch the show know that I don't often use polls, but there is some use to it, right? It's, it's still useful to pay some attention to it. Uh, oftentimes, the people conducting the polls, well, they tend to jerry-rig things in their favor. Yeah. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that almost across the board, even with polls from historically left-wing organizations, are showing that it's at very least very close with Trump and that Trump is gaining ground. But like when it comes to swing states, the polls, again, are mostly showing Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are very, very close in this race. And keep in mind, too, that when we're talking about Michigan, and again, Muslim American voters there, the issue of Gaza and Israel and the way this is, again, turning a lot of votes, it's not just among Muslim Americans. Actually, a lot of the far left, uh, a lot of, you know, Black Lives Matter, for example, a lot of the Democrat grassroots, Democrat Socialists of America, even, they have gone very strong on that issue, and they've even been protesting the Biden administration. For a lot of people on that side of the political spectrum, that is one of the biggest issues for the upcoming elections. And that's going to impact the vote in a lot of these different areas, not just in Michigan. That, for them, is a very divisive issue. And even on the other side of it, the pro-Israel voters, right, a lot of the Jewish Americans and others, they're also concerned that, again, the Biden administration has tried, tried again, trying to calm down some of the you know, Democrat factions that support the other side of it while trying to maintain support for Israel. But they're looking at the Democratic Party as a whole, not just at the Biden administration. They're looking at the Democrat Party in its entirety. And there are a lot of them, maybe not saying they're going to vote for Trump, but they're saying maybe they're not going to vote for anybody, or maybe they'll vote for a third party. There's also that faction, which is becoming very strong as well. And so again, uh, a few of these incidents that have taken place in the world stage are becoming very, very divisive politically. And a lot of the, uh, let's say, pollsters and people working the campaigns, they're having trouble dealing with it. Now look, in other news, there's a story coming out from Springfield, Ohio, who recently had the cat stories, saying that immigrant students are not allowed to be given grades below a C. You can't fail them. I'll be going into this after I come back from a quick break. Saying that students who are illegal immigrants cannot fail in school. Now, look, according to Blaze Media, these students are not being allowed to give grades below a C. They had the exclusive on it said this. Immigrant students are given as much, a much easier grading scale at a school in Springfield, Ohio, effectively preventing them from failing because they are still considered English language learners. An email from the superintendent confirms. Now look, in my personal opinion, the purpose of school is not just to graduate. If you think that the, you know, the moral thing and the kind thing to do is just give the kids an A and you know, pass them along, that's not why you're going to school. The purpose of going to school is to actually learn. And if a policy makes it the people who fail just pass anyway, <laughs> then what's the purpose of school, right? I'd say this is undermining, if it's true, right? This is undermining the very idea of what school is. <clears throat> if you try to make it so that nobody can fail or people of certain groups can't fail, the then you undermine the integrity of the education system. 
And I'd say on that note as well, it's also not being responsible to the students. If you make it so that somebody passes, even though they failed, what happens when they go into the real world and they try to get a job and they don't know like basic you know, things you learn in early grades of school? We don't know which grades these are. But if you look at even the literacy rates of kids going into college, you have kids who are graduating from high school who are illiterate. Is that being responsible to them? Is that the kind thing to do? Is it nice to just pass people along even if they fail and even if they're not learning anything? And what happens when you lower the bar that much? Well, you remove the incentive to push yourself. You remove the incentive and the idea that if you don't do well in life, that you're not going to make it. You create a false expectation, in other words, of the very systems that kind of make the world, you know, the wheels of the world turn. And you make it sound like everything just has to be handed to you on a silver platter. And if it doesn't, it's being mean to you. That's not the way the world works. Now, like that said, um, on a personal note, I'd actually, be, I'd actually say that vocational programs would be a better solution to this. Now, that said, in other news, if Donald Trump wins the election, he's saying one of the first moves he's going to take as president will be to carry out mass deportations of illegal immigrants. Now, some of his quotes that's been taken out of context, you might remember they said, Trump said he's going to be a dictator. Uh, the actual statement he had was when journalists are saying, would you be a dictator? And they were you know, accusing him of that. He says, only for one day. And the implication that's was that he said that he is going to, again, basically enact laws day one of his presidency to carry out mass deportations. That's the actual implication of what he said that's now been taken out of context. Now, oh, House Speaker Mike Johnson is saying a group of around 4.5 million illegal immigrants will be the first wave to be deported. New York Post said this with an interview with them. It says, should former President Donald Trump win back the White House, as many as 4.5 million migrants, illegal immigrants, who entered the U.S. illegally will be a first priority for deportation. House Speaker Mike Johnson told the Post in an exclusive interview. Now it says that Trump, 78, has already <laughs> floated the removal of nearly 20 million migrants if he becomes the 47th president. And his closest ally in the House, again, Mike Johnson, they say, sees an opportunity to fast-track the removal of the most dangerous of the lot. And here's what he says, quote, There's about 4.5 million who would be the first priority for that, people who have already committed crimes. That's according to Johnson saying this on Thursday. And it says, quote, They're in the system now for shoplifting or whatever it is, or having done things that are uh, that are untoward or unlawful. While the figure, 4.5 million, quoted by Johnson, is far higher than any federal records show, Republicans have noted that the Harris-Biden administration is consistently low-balling immigration stats and ignoring nearly 2 million gotaways who evaded arrest when coming into the country. This is important because actually you have two different sets of illegal immigrants. <laughs> They're the ones who are trying to apply for asylum and are part of that process. And because they got rid of Remain in Mexico, where you know you try to come here and you apply and you're allowed to, you know, these days wait in America until that application goes through, which might take 10 years, right? Trump made it so that if you want to apply, you have to wait in Mexico. And a lot of people are saying, well, I'm not going to stay in Mexico for 10 years while I wait for my immigration status to go to court. They changed that. No, no that. way. That's one group, right? One group is that very large group that is kind of using the immigration system or using the amnesty system. The other group are people who have illegally crossed. Again, the ones who are not going across and just turning themselves in. These are your just illegal immigrants. And again, you know, one of the issues we have is that there's not even just the recent illegal immigrants. There's a lot of them have been here for a very long time. You have migrant gangs. We have the current ones like Trend de Aragua, but there's a lot of older ones too, tied with the, tied with the cartels, tied with other organizations. And many of them who have, have, again, entered the country illegally, again, not even the ones who came in recently, 
Previous to, the, previous to the Biden administration, there were already an estimated 11 million illegal immigrants in the U.S. who would be considered illegal. Well, that's a crime, right? That makes you a criminal if you have violated the laws of the country. Uh, it's not clear, again, if there's...